So what we're going to be doing is I'm going to start the session in a moment. We did get a little bit of a late start, so normally we'd end by about 8.30, so it might be a few minutes past that. We'll see how we go. Then we're going to have a nice supper together uh, and have another chat, hang around for as long as you want, go whenever you want, no, no problem whatsoever there. And of course, um, the other thing to remember is that there's no obligation with uh, anything as far as the Christadelphians is concerned. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Now to introduce myself. Um, my name's Mike Steele. Uh, many of you know me, met some of you don't. Uh, I'm married to Ruth. Ruth's not here tonight. She's mining one of our sick little grandchildren so that my daughter and son-in-law and a couple of the kids could come uh, tonight. Uh, we have nine grandchildren. What a handful. Let me tell you, they are a handful, but they're a very delightful handful, I can tell you. That was a recent photo, not taken not all that long ago uh, when we were over in Disneyland and we had a real good time over there. I've got a footy team for grandkids. I've got seven boys and just two girls. So I'll have to tell Darren and the other uh, daughter to get cranking and maybe get some more girls coming our way to even the team up a little bit. But who knows? I don't know if that's going to happen or not. We'll leave that up to them. Uh, as far as what I do is concerned, um, I've run my own business for the last 31 years. Um, I used to worry the daylights out of everybody to tell you you needed a clipsal safety switch for your safety of your children and so on and so forth. I did that for about 20 years. Now I'm worrying you to buy yourself a care alert or for your mum and dad to buy a care alert because that's the business I operate. So uh, I've been doing that for around about um, 20, 30, I'm oh, not care alert, but in my own business for about 31 years. Now, um, you're probably saying, well, why do you want to tell me all that? Well, I think it's nice that you know who I am, that I am quite normal, that I do have a family, that we do have children, grandchildren, and that we do live basically a pretty normal life like you do. We make a living, we pay our taxes and so on. But I'm also telling you this because if I did not believe in the veracity, the truthfulness and the accuracy of this book, the Bible, I can tell you this without fear of contradiction whatsoever. If I didn't believe that this Bible was worthy of attention, I would not be here tonight talking to you. I'd be doing something else. I'd be at the bowls or I'd be down at the local pub or I'd be doing something else, you know, not lawn bowls, Nathan. <laughs> I'm not quite that old yet, not lawn bowls. Um, I'd be doing something else. I'd, the last place I'd be do, doing is standing here talking about the Bible if I didn't think that it was accurate and that it is what it claims to be, the inspired word of God because I'm sure that there's a lot of other entertainment, a lot of other fascinating things out there that could take up my time. But I deem it a privilege and a pleasure to stand here with you and to be able to explain why I believe this Bible and why many other Christadelphians do as well, and why in fact all Christadelphians believe this Bible to be the inspired word of God. And it is, as I said, a pleasure and a privilege to be able to demonstrate that to you over these next six seminar evenings. Tonight's a little bit of an introduction, but we will get into a little bit of a prophecy night, and then hopefully that'll be laying the platform and the foundation for following, um, following nights that we will enjoy together. Now, when you um, complete this course, you will be given a certificate of, I'm going to say compliance, that's probably not the word, uh, competency, that you've actually done a course on Bible prophecy. Uh, there's one that's my name, Michael. Uh, I've got to have a look at it, Cyril Albert Horace Steele. And see, everyone laughs at my name. Why is wrong with that? It's actually not that, but someone might, must have made that name up and decided to put it on a certificate, and that was the only copy I had. So there you go. Uh, and uh, this certificate of completion will be given to each one of you, just to tuck away somewhere, put it on display, show people that, hey, you know what, I did do something, a little course on the Bible. I did learn something about the Bible. And I think that's just a nice way to end off the seminar series. So stay around with us and you'll definitely get one of those certificates. Now I said right at the beginning that as Christadelphians, the last thing we want you to feel is uncomfortable. We are not Bible bashers. We don't, we're not on a recruitment drive at all to, to swell the numbers of the Christadelphians. If we wanted to do that, we'd set up a big marquee down the road, we'd bring in a few pop bands and serve you know, coffees and teas and a few hallelujahs and get people in and sign on the dotted line and we'll have your money, thanks very much, and, you know, believe in God and you'll be saved. We're not that type of organisation or religious movement at all. Christadelphians are Bible students. We love studying our Bibles, we really enjoy it, and we are what is called a lay movement. 
Does anyone know what a lay movement is? Not we all lay down and go to sleep, and better not do that on these seminars. <laughs> not on my watch. <laughs> Does anyone know what a lay movement is? Chooks lay. If chooks lay eggs, good one, Lionel. <laughs> No hierarchy and no paid ministry. There's no hierarchy in the Christadelphians. We don't have levels of importance. We're all equal in the sight of God and in the sight of each other and we have no paid ministry at all. So you will never be asked for one red cent while you're here, nor neither will you be, ever be badgered to become a Christadelphian. All we want to do is we want to present you some information. What you do with that information is entirely up to you. And you might say, you know what, I didn't even find that interesting. I don't even want to know any more about it, or you might say, you know what, that was fascinating, perhaps there is some more to that, maybe I want to know a little bit more. We're here to help you, so long as you want to be helped, the moment you've, you know, hands in the air saying, that's enough for me, that's fine, we don't chase after you and try to sign you up, so please feel comfortable about that, you, you, you can actually be guaranteed that that's how we operate. Let's get into it. First thing I want to do is get rid of this chap off the screen, because uh, I put this man up because he always comes up in conversation when we always talk about prophecy. This is the man Nostradamus. You know, we always ask the question, just how reliable was this man? Well, he's now been proven. I mean, about four or five years ago, there was so much TV coverage about this man, magazine coverage. I think it must have been some sort of an anniversary of his existence or birth or whatever it was. And they try, and of course with the media, as we typically know the media is very well at doing, they conjure it up this whole fascinating story about this man. And of course everyone was mesmerised at how many prophecies he made that were right and, and so on. Well, it's since been shown and documented very well that this man is a fraud was a fraud, was a charlatan, was no better than you and me at being able to predict the future, but he even did, he did die a pauper, as we know, a poor man, but at the end of the day, is most of his writings were absolute rubbish. Some of the ones that he did write that looked like they may have been something in it, he actually copied from the Bible across into his writings and claimed them to be his, just rearranged the, the grammatics a little bit. Here's an example, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on this in any way, shape or form, but this is one of his prophecies. He talked about, um, in the invitation to a holocaust, he said the synagogue, and this is a very ambiguous way in which he writes, by the way. You know, you can almost make anything out of this, but here we go. The synagogue, sterile and without bearing fruit, will be received into the hands of the infidels. The daughter of the persecuted exiles of Babylon will be miserable because her wings of flight will be clipped. Well, that's what he wrote, and this was the invitation, or sorry, the interpretation of that particular passage. Uh, the Arab attacks on their neighbours will also be directed against the state of Israel. Well, we might say, wow, that's happened a few times. Well, yes, it has happened quite a few times and probably won't be the end times it happens either. We've got a possible nuclear war about to start over there. We'll talk about that in the later seminars. Uh, but uh, here we have here that Israel is going to be defeated, according to Nostradamus, going to be totally defeated by the Arab armies. Uh, their final death blow will come when she finds her air force destroyed, leaving her at the mercy of the Arab conquerors. Nostradamus also predicted that by 1990 an Arab leader would ally himself with China and make a world dominion for another world empire. Well, 1990, my calculations, is 23 years ago. And that certainly hasn't happened. And the moment Nostradamus said Israel would be wiped off the map is the moment we knew he was a fraud absolute fraud because the Bible says exactly the opposite and so when you consider Nostradamus you have to know that everything or many of the things he spoke were in direct contradiction to what this Bible does teach so can we trust Nostradamus well absolutely not and we're going to show you that if you're going to trust anything you trust this book here it is fascinating. It is so interesting. It sometimes has you on the edge of your seat. Wow, what are, what's next? What is going to happen? And as we go through some of these prophecies, you're going to learn quite a lot of things. I'm getting rid of these $2 glasses because they're annoying me already. And I'm going back to my grandma looking glasses that I'm sorry, you'll just have to put up with them. Is that all right? Doesn't look too bad, does it, Johnny? All right? Good. Excellent. Uh, let's get into it. Now, Wayne, are we all set to go? Excellent. Okay, no one else is coming along. That's not good, but it's good that we can get going without any interruptions. We want to have a look at this book, the Bible, because we really want to study it and see exactly what it does say. The Bible is a huge book. What we're going to do in six weeks is a small portion of it, and we're going to look at Bible prophecy. 
And we're going to hopefully make all of you think, oh, wow, there's something in this. This is really fascinating. This is really interesting. I want to know more. I want to keep knowing more. Before we get into the, the Bible as far as prophecy is concerned, I just want to show you something interesting about this book. Now, by the way, you've all got a Bible in front of you, have you? Some of you have got your own Bibles. Some of you have bought, got ones given to you at the front. Can I just ask you to open, if you have got a Bible given to you, can you just open up the front of it and write your name in it, please, straight away, so we don't, you don't lose it, because sometimes people leave them behind and we're not sure whose it is. So get your pens out. Write your names right in the front of that Bible. That's yours to keep. And the Bibles we are using, you might say, oh no, that's the old language, the these and the thous and, and so on. It's not hard to understand, but it is a little bit antiquated. The King James Version is still regarded as the best possible version for Bible study. I'm not saying the best possible version as far as reading it and understanding it is concerned because you can get the new King James Version, which is quite good, takes the these and thous out. But when it comes to real Bible study, it's this Bible upon which many of our Bible study aids were, were actually uh, based upon, like Strong's Concordance. Uh, it's all based on the King James Version. So if you try to marry up the Strong's Concordance with the New King James or uh, the um, uh, Contemporary English Version, CEV and so on, you can't do your proper study because they don't link together. There's nothing wrong with those modern, modern uh, versions for getting a bit of sense of the understanding of the reading, but if you really want to be a Bible student, you really always have to have a King James Version on you. That's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. And it is generally the opinion of Bible students that want to study their Bibles. But be that as it may, it's not that hard to, to understand. It, you, you'll get through it okay. Now, our amazing Bible. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment in a moment. We're all going to work on this, and it's not going to be hard to do, and it's going to be quite interesting. The outstanding credentials of this book that you've got in front of you proves to me anyway, and I hope you'll find it a little fascinating, that its compilation, that is its way in which it's been put together, indicates without a shadow of a doubt it could not have been done by just mere mortal men. Absolutely, really impossible. The way in which this book has been compiled and come to us is really totally amazing. For example, there were 40 independent writers of the book of the Bible. All right, so there's, there's, does anyone know how many books of the Bible there are? Yell it out. 66 books in the Bible, all right, from Genesis right through to Revelation. And as Christadelphian kids, we teach them when they're young to recite those books, not the actual book, but the, the name of the books off by heart. Uh, are right up to Revelation. So that when they're in a meeting or in a Bible study <coughs> class and someone says, can you turn to Joel chapter 3, they know where Joel is because they go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, right through till they get to Joel. And they can find it. Most times they know roughly where it is by the time they're teenagers anyway. So um, you're right, there's 66 books in the Bible and they were written across 40 independent writers. Uh, using over 20 different vocations. So those writers had different jobs. For example, we had fishermen. The disciples were fishermen. We had a doctor. Does anyone who know who the doctor was? What book he wrote? He wrote two, actually. Luke. Luke. And what else did he write, Ross? Acts. Acts. So Luke was a physician. And he wrote Luke and Acts. We had, a, uh, we had a number of kings write books of the Bible. David wrote some books of the Bible. Solomon wrote books of the Bible. Hezekiah arranged some of the Psalms. We had even a singer, the Psalms of Asaph, put together some Psalms. Uh, we had um, all sorts of people. Shepherd, David was a shepherd as well as a king. So we have 20 different occupations, which is quite amazing in itself. They lived in 10 different countries, all these writers. Across ten, no, they didn't all live in Israel. Ten different countries are mentioned where these writers were when they were writing these particular uh, transcripts of the Bible. And this is the most amazing part. They lived over a time span of 1,500 years. So this book took 1,500 years to compile by 40 different writers, 20 different occupations, and they lived in ten different countries. And you might say, well, what's the point? Well, the point is this. 
Um, we're going to do an experiment to make that point known. Now, Jackson, you want to come out here for me? And Liam, come out here. I'm going to get you to give one of these to each person. Now, you must have a very handsome grandpa. Would that be right? Was that a yes? I hope it was. <laughs> Jackson, you go that way. Liam, you go that way. Um, what I'm going to get you to do here is take this, and very quickly, I'm only going to give you a couple of minutes to do this. Read it. You're going to make some predictions. I want you to write on there. I have to put your name on the top. I want you to write on there your predictions as to the questions that are on there. Don't look at each other. Do your own. Don't check out your neighbour, your next door uh, person or the person behind you. I want you to write your own predictions on that piece of paper. And for all being good so far, Julie's bringing out some lollies. <laughs> now our kids' eyes are widening up, these grandkids. Now we have a bit of fun with this. Don't try and make it too serious because obviously no one knows the answers to those questions. Although you probably all think you know the answer to I think the second question or third question, but anyway. Did you, if you didn't all get one, you might have to share one between two. I'm not going to be able to look at everybody's, but I'm going to collect them up in around about 60 seconds time, so you're going to have to be quick. <coughs> Jackson, you're going to have a go at it? Okay. So basically what you are doing is not looking at your neighbour, not looking at the person sitting next to you or behind you. You are going to make your own prediction as to who you think or what you think is going to happen in the future. So, this is the, uh, the point we're going to make. By the way, while you're still doing that, the Bible lists 2,930 different people by name in the Bible. 2,930 people are mentioned in the Bible by name, and 1,551 different towns, cities, villages, countries are also mentioned. So we've got a pretty amazing book on our hands, especially when you consider it took 1,500 years to write by 40 different writers. None of them knew each other, well, some of them knew each other, but most of them didn't have any contact with each other. They didn't have phones, faxes, emails, uh, anything of that nature whatsoever to be able to contact and uh, talk to each other. So I think you're starting to get the gist of this little experiment. Now we'll get into the prophecy in a moment. Right, boys, are you nearly finished, Liam and Jackson? Because I need you to pick them up real quick. Go, start collecting them. If you haven't finished, don't worry. Not a test, not an exam. No one's going to fail. No names on them, so I don't even know who you are. Just bring them out to me. This is just a little experiment. So you start to see why I put this slide on the, uh, on the screen. Don't read them, Liam. <laughs> You're trying to get some inside information, eh? I don't, think it's, I don't think there was anything on there who's going to win the Melbourne Cup this year. Okay, now I'm not going to read all these out. You can come and have a look at these afterwards. There's probably some funny answers. We always tend to get some funny answers. Uh, the Prime Minister of Australia in 2020 will be Brenton Sanderson. So I'm assuming he's uh, something to do with it. Is he a coach of the Crows or something? Yeah. Is that right? Uh, Collingwood will win the next grand final. 20th of July 2013, the next uh, major earthquake will hit. Uh, the next world war will be between the Muslims and Europe, and there will be a, a definite financial collapse in, uh, in the next five, five years. So I'm just going to go through a couple of these. Someone said Snoopy is going to be the next uh, uh, grand uh, uh, prime minister. Uh, major earthquake is going to hit at Japan. Um, actually, it's funny, the next major will hit. There you go, someone's picked up, that should be a date, someone's picked up a country, that's fine, it could be either. China and North Korea is going to have a, a, a Barney with us. Uh, it will happen. Uh, again, the opposition leader <laughs> will, be the, will be the Prime Minister in 2020. Uh, the Crows are going to win. 
uh, Iran and Israel, I'll put that down, that's interesting. May 2013, there's going to be an earthquake. Uh, there won't be any depression in the next five years. Uh, Mickey Mouse is going to be Prime Minister. Jackson's going to be Prime Minister. <laughs> Malcolm Turnbull. New Zealand is going to be a major earthquake. The USA and Middle East, World War. So we've got all sorts of answers here. Uh, we've got obviously quite a few pro supporters here. Port Power. I won't ask you who that is, it might be embarrassing. Um, someone thinks they're going to be the next Prime Minister. Russia and USA. Melbourne where the earthquake's going to hit. Rome where the earthquake's going to hit. Shane Warne's going to be Prime Minister. Tony Abbott's going to be Prime Minister. Kevin Rood. Kevin Rood. I think it meant to be Rudd. Uh, Hugh Jackman. We can go on. John Howard's coming back. Uh, <laughs> I can assure you I'm not going to be Prime Minister. Uh, a no hoper is going to be Prime Minister. We have got so many different answers. In fact, you can come down and have a look at those. There's some few funny ones there. Um, the point we're making, you're all seated in the same hall. There's probably about, I don't know how many are here, 30 odd, not 40. You're all sitting next to each other, doesn't matter. I told you not to talk to each other or anything. But you're not separated by time. You're definitely not separated by communications uh, because you're right near each other. Uh, and you are basically all here together in one place. Well, remember how the Bible was written? 1,500 year time span between the entire time it took to start the Bible to its finish. 40 different writers, many of them never knew each other, never had contact with each other. And yet for all of the above credentials, did you know that in the Bible there's not one contradiction? And in its doctrine, or in its prophecy, or in its teaching. In other words, you can open this Bible here, and it doesn't matter which writer writes, they write about the same thing. They all talk about the plan and purpose of God. They all talk about how it's going to happen. They all talk about prophecy the same way, with the same understanding, with the same outcomes that's going to happen. And yet no one knew each other. No one had any contact with each other. Some of them might have, as we said, but most of them didn't. And here we are in the hall putting to the test our ability to see if we can all predict the future and all try and come up with the same answers. And we've got a multitude of varied answers. That in itself to me is a miracle because there's no other book on the planet that has the same credentials as this book, the Bible, and comes up 100% trumps every time. So that's just the way it's been compiled. You will not find any contradictions in it and its message is entire, from, is exactly the same in its entirety from Genesis 1 verse 1 through to the last verse of Revelation. No contradictions and all the same message. Fascinating. Absolutely brilliant. And there you go, that's, what, uh, that's, that's the way in which the Bible is made up. Well, I guess, can we answer, or can we trust Bible prophecy? Well, I'm going to put this challenge out and say right from the word go, absolutely 100%. We're going to prove that in the coming weeks. We're going to absolutely show you that you can believe in this Bible with so much confidence that when you go away from here, as we go in, week in, week out, that you'll leave this premises and you'll go, Wow, that is fascinating. And next time you pick up your papers, you're going to read something in your papers and you'll go, you know what, I remember learning about that in our seminars. I remember that's going to happen. I knew that was going to happen because the Bible told me it was going to happen. And you'll see that because you're going to see past events that have come about with 100% pinpoint accuracy that really has us on the edge of our seat to say, wow, I really reckon there's something in this book. And there really is. All right, what is Bible prophecy? How do we interpret and understand what Bible prophecy is. What is a good analogy that tells us what Bible prophecy is? This is the best one I've ever heard. It's not mine, but I reckon it's a very accurate one. Bible prophecy is the mould into which history is being poured. Now just digest that for a moment. Bible prophecy is the mould into which history is being poured. That glass is a mould. It's a shape. And if I pour something into that glass, like this water here, as so long as I don't shake, that water is going to fill the exact parameters of that mould, of that glass. It can't go anywhere else but in that shape. Now, I've always told, some of you heard this story before, but I always tell it anyway, because I remember, I'm a, I'm a 
I'm a fisherman, like Fred's a fisherman. I always catch bigger fish than Fred, but it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we, like, we like our fishing, and as Fred knows, when we were younger and when my dad was a keen fisherman, we used to make our own sinkers. You ever made your own sinkers, right? You, you get a mould, you, you, you get a piece of timber, you dig out a shape of your sinker, you, you, you form it all up and you pour molten lead into it and it, it creates, it's a mould, that sinker comes out that shape. Well, this is a great analogy, you can start to understand. Bible prophecy is a mould that God has created into which history is being poured. It can't go outside that mould because God won't allow it because he's made that mould and it has to fit that mould. What you're going to see in about seminar number three is men have tried to break that mould unwittingly, unintentionally, doesn't matter. It looked like the mould was going to be broken, especially when it comes to the nation of Israel and God intervened very quickly and very decisively to make sure they didn't break that mould. It's a fascinating story and you'll, you'll hear about that in about seminar number three, I reckon. So that's what Bible prophecy in, a, in an analogy, in a term, is. And I think that's a very, very good one to, to try and remember. And we'll come back to that every now and again. The other question we would ask is, what purpose does Bible prophecy have? What is the purpose of Bible prophecy? Well, the purpose of Bible prophecy, as it says on the screen there, is to clearly show to you and me, to everybody that's got eyes to read and ears to listen, it's to show to us that God has a plan and purpose with this earth and it is bringing about this plan and this purpose. That is what this, um, th that is what the purpose of prophecy is. Now, let me ask you this question. If I was to tell you uh, that there would be, and I'll just go back because I just pushed the button accidentally there. If I was to tell you that there was going to be an earthquake uh, in the, um, let's try to get that one back up again. If I was to tell you that there was going to be an earthquake in Melbourne on uh, March the 1st this year, and you said, yeah, yeah, right, sure. And sure enough, on March the 1st, there is a major earthquake in Melbourne that destroyed a lot of buildings. You would go, wow, <laughs> how did he know that? And you might think that's a more of a curiosity thing. That's amazing. And then if I was to say, well, in Sydney, on July the 1st, there is going to be a tornado ripped through the middle of Sydney and is going to cause $100 million worth of damage. And sure enough, on July the 1st, a tornado ripped through Sydney and there's $100 million worth of damage. You're going to start to think, wow, what is going on here? How does he know all that? That is just amazing. And then if I was to follow it up and say, well, on August the 15th, Adelaide's going to be hit by a tsunami that's going to decimate the western suburbs and right up to the foothills, I'll guarantee you by the time that you, you, you know, August the 15th comes around that I'll guarantee every one of you will be up at Mount Lofty on that day. And the reason why you will is because two, two times I've prophesied and I've told you things that are going to happen on a set day and a time and an era and, and I was very accurate about telling you and they did happen. You're not going to doubt the third one, are you? You're not going to start saying, oh, well, he got two of these remote prophecies right. Surely it's not going to happen the third time. I'll guarantee you, you will be up there on Mount Lofty waiting for the tsunami. Well, it's no different with Bible prophecy. And in actual fact, it's quite amazing because the Bible prophecy, and God has spoken very clearly in the prophecies of the Bible, saying certain things would happen. And they have happened with pinpoint accuracy, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Wouldn't it be sensible of us to start thinking about some of the prophecies that haven't quite yet happened, that we can see happening? So the Bible says this will happen, it's happened, 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 this one's going to happen, it hasn't quite yet happened. Why would we say, well, I don't really want to worry about that one because I don't think it will happen. That's the aim of Bible prophecy is to tell you and me that God's in control, he has a plan and purpose with this earth, and he wants you to be absolutely riveted to your seats by what's contained in this book and how he is in control. So that's what Bible prophecy is all about and what it serves. 
Now, you talk about the plan and purpose of God. Well, now, get your Bibles open because there's going to be a few times I'm going to get you to colour in some verses in your Bibles that will stand out, that will really stand out to you. So the first one is in Numbers 14.21. It's on page 136 of your Bibles. Numbers 14, verse 21. If you come there, you will see verse 21, and it simply is a quotation that says, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now grab yourself a coloured pencil. Oh, is there any coloured pencil, Julie? No coloured pencils? Well, if you've got a pen or a pencil, you can just put a little asterisk alongside of it or whatever. Uh, because we really want you to be aware, or even write it, tell you what, write it in the front of your books and your notes if you like, because I really want you to colour these in and, uh, and get these quotes coloured in in your Bible. But at least make a note of it in the front of your, um, even in the front of your Bible if you want, or in the front of your uh, notes. Numbers 14, 21, page 136. What a simple statement. Truly I live. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now that is a, one of the most important statements in the Bible because that in itself is a prophecy. God has made a statement that has not yet been fulfilled. I do not know any time in the history of mankind from Adam and Eve right up until now where this whole earth has been filled with the glory of God. If you know of a time in history when that's happened, please let me know, because I don't. Mankind has messed things up pretty bad ever since he's been left in charge, and, uh, and it's certainly anything but the glory of God filling this earth at the moment. So there is a fascinating and a wonderful quotation that we need to understand is a, is a prophecy. Well, how on earth is that ever going to be fulfilled? Well, you'll see how that's going to be fulfilled in, in our various seminars that we are going to be doing. Ah, here we go. Do you want to just throw out a few pencils to people? Probably any colours. It doesn't really matter what colour you, 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 you do this. Thanks, Nath. So you got that, page 136 of your Bibles. Verse 21, colour it in. It'll stand out to you. It's a very important reference to have uh, in your Bible coloured in. It's a prophecy that God has made. And by the way, when God says, as truly as I live, that's classified as an oath. That means God's put his name to it. And unlike pro the promises <laughs> that our, our uh, wonderful politicians uh, make, and no sooner make than they, and they break, God doesn't break his promises. When he puts his name to a promise, to an oath, he intends on keeping it. So there's a cast iron guarantee that he's going to fill this earth with his glory. Well, here's another quote. Uh, page 512, this is in one of the Psalms, just open up to that, Psalm 72, which by the way is a wonderful prophecy in itself, but here's a good little verse out of that Psalm that you can colour in, that tells us what God intends on doing, and we've only picked two, there's literally dozens and dozens of, of, of these same promises throughout the whole Bible, and they don't, they don't contradict each other, that God is going to fill this earth with his glory. So when you get to Psalm 72, you've got verse 19, page 512, and it simply says this, Blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. All right, you're colouring that verse in? Because that's a very good verse to colour in. There's just two. The Lord's Prayer is a classic. Remember how uh, Jesus taught his disciples of how to pray? I think we all, well I don't know about now, but when we all went to school at my age, we all had to learn the Lord's Prayer. I don't think they bother about that anymore unless you go to a, a good, perhaps some Christian schools might teach it, but I bet you that most of us here probably know the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. What's the next word say? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a prophecy. That's a prophecy in itself. Not, not 
Thy will be done in heaven and leave it at that. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, heaven's full of the glory of God. So what Jesus said is it's all going to happen down here on this planet in which we're living. So there's plenty of quotations that would teach us of what God's plan and purpose is all about. Right, let's start moving into some prophecy. We want to have a little look at some prophecy and we want to just make a few quotations known about prophecy. Uh, and here's a, a really good one because we're going to look at Daniel tonight. We're going to look at him over the next couple of nights. The prophecy made by Daniel or given to Daniel by God. Here's a quotation that God uh, makes known to us through Daniel. That's a really good one. He said, God changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings. He sets up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He reveals the deep and secret things. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. He makes known what shall be in the latter days. Now, just lock that up in your head because you're going to see that reference come up time and time again in these seminars and even tonight. What's going to happen in the latter days? Days, And we're going to show to you with absolute proof that we are living in the latter days. Very important. As we said, that word there is latter days is extremely important. All fulfilled prophecies made in the Bible are intended to let us who are living in the latter days know what's going to happen next. So the prophecies that are given and have been fulfilled are really for your benefit and my benefit because we're the ones that live in the latter days. And I think that's amazing because we are really and truly living on the cusp of the fulfilment of the plan and purpose of God. Make no mistake about that because I believe it with all my heart and I hope we're going to be able to show you that very clearly. Well, who's in control? That's the question. Who is in control of this earth? Well... Uh, here's a quotation I want you to colour in, page 733, another very important quotation in the Bible. This will tell you who's in charge of what's going on in this world today. It's not Obama, it's not the Pope, it's not uh, the Prime Minister of England or our own Prime Minister who's just hanging on for grim death for her own job. It's certainly none of those world leaders. This quotation here tells us who's in charge of this globe. And everyone might say, well, if he's in charge, how come it's in such a bad, bad way? Well, when I say he's in charge, mankind has a free will and he's doing what he does best, which is ruin everything and mess everything up from a moral point of view and from a religious point of view and from a political point of view, mankind gets it terribly wrong. But God is superintending over all that to bring about his plan and purpose and he's putting in power whom he wants, he's taking out of power whom he wants, so that the whole lot is moving towards one goal and that is to fill this earth with his glory. How that's going to happen all will be revealed as we go through our seminars. This is a brilliant quote. To the intent that the living may know, that's you and me, because we're still alive now. I'm not talking about all those who are dead in the past. That the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. He gives it to whomsoever he will. He sets over it the basis of men. So we can see that God is using the political arenas of this age and in ages past uh, as, a, as a giant chessboard. That's how I like to view it. It's a big chessboard and he's just manoeuvring countries, political systems, world leaders, and he's putting them all into position for the big checkmate. And the checkmate is the greatest event that's going to happen on this earth. And that is when, and we'll keep that a secret at the moment, we'll keep that to ourselves, but it is a momentous event that is going to happen. So when you put that in context then, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. And all these world leaders that get put in for a specific reason and get taken out in the most amazing fashion, and then someone else fills their shoes. And then someone else comes in through the back door through the most amazing processes. All of these world leaders, you can be absolutely guaranteed from Daniel 4 verse 17, God put them there. And he's put them there for a specific reason. And when he's finished with them, he will remove them and put someone else in for a specific reason. Yes, sir, I didn't catch your name. Oh, Graham. Graham. Just one question. Sure. God is in control of the kingdom of... Oh, yes, go on. Except for our free will. Correct. We have a free will. Is he in control of everything else? 
He's in control of the political arenas of this world to ensure that his plan and purpose will come about. It, these are always going to be questions, Graham, and I fully appreciate it, and I'm, I'd love to have a talk to you about that later. But we're always going to get questions about blaming God for what's going on in the world today. I definitely do not believe in evolution. Sorry? How did mosquitoes get on this planet? Well, mosquitoes were came as probably part of the curse. The curse in the garden. Do you believe in creation? I'm agnostic. Oh, okay. No, the curse was brought upon mankind because of his own foolishness. You only got to read Genesis chapter three to realise that the curse came upon mankind because of mankind's own foolishness. But if he made them perfect, they would not They weren't made perfect. They were made very good. Well, if you don't make a car perfect, it'll go astray and kill someone. And you don't hold the person driving responsible. <laughs> Look, you know, Graham, I understand the point of view you're trying to make, except, of course, we can go round and round in circles talking about it. There are no truths. There are no what? Truths. Truths. I don't quite understand what you mean. You're just going to go round in circles because you have no answers. Oh, no, no, no. no. I, I, could, I could speak to you direct, but these people have come here to hear the prophecies. I would love it. I would love the opportunity. Definitely. But allow me to get through this information, if you will. And I, look, you, you do raise some good points, Graham. I'm not here to argue with you now. But definitely, I would love to talk to you about it. But I just want to get through this information first, and I'll talk to you. But every one of those questions you ask are very valid. I appreciate it. And I will talk to you afterwards about it. And I'm sure there might even be some other Christadelphians who would love to talk to you about it as well. Because I can see it worries you, and I understand that. And it's very valid that it does, and I appreciate it. So we do appreciate you coming along. Don't you worry. <laughs> you keep us all on our toes. That's a good thing. All right, so just getting back to the point we're making. God rules in the kingdom of men. He puts in power whomever he wants so that his plan can be worked out. He has an ultimate goal. That goal is to fill this earth with his glory and fill this earth with his glory. He will because he's put his name to that oath, to that promise. Um, God also says in one of the minor prophets in Amos, uh, he says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So he's telling the prophets, whom we're now going to come and consider in the next six weeks, six seminars, that I'm going to reveal things to you that you're going to write down in, in this book called the Bible and they're going to be dispersed amongst all the people that want to take the time and read this book so that they can be impressed upon with what I am saying and what I am going to do. So uh, again, I stress, I'm very, very confident by the end of this series that you will have some uh, confidence in this book, if not a lot of confidence in this book, and hopefully that's our goal, that you'll go away knowing that this book can offer you something very, very special. It can offer you uh, a lifetime of happiness now and certainly a lifetime of happiness in a future age to come. All right, confidence in Bible prophecy. Uh, here's a great quotation, 2 Peter 1 verse 19. Now I've put up a different translation here so that you can get the gist of what this is actually saying. Here we go. This is 2 Peter, New Testament quotation read to you from the uh, contemporary English version. He said, all of this makes even more certain that what the prophet said is true. So you should pay close attention to their message as you would to a lamp shining in a dark place. Now you know what it's like when you're stumbling around in the dark and you're in the dark, you don't know where you're going and all of a sudden there's a flick of a switch and there's a lamp comes on. And it's an illuminating lamp and it looks, oh wow, thank goodness there's a lamp. All of a sudden you're drawn to that lamp. God is saying Bible prophecies like that. We can be groping around in darkness trying to work out what on earth am I here for? What's going on in this world? Where's the next you know, problem going to be? What's going to happen? And bang, we open up the Bible, we read the prophecies. It's like a light coming on in our lives. It's like a light coming on in a dark room. That's what prophecy does. He says it's like a lamp shining in some dark place. You must keep on paying attention until daylight comes and the morning star arises in your hearts. Now notice what this says. The prophets did not think these things up on their own. 
but they were guided by the Spirit of God. So in other words, what Peter is saying here is that this has not come about by private interpretation. What you have in this book here was given by God through men of old. That's what Peter is saying. Well, I'm not expecting you to accept that. Definitely not expecting you to sit there and say, oh yeah, that's good, I accept that. Because no point in saying, yes, I accept that, without it being proved. And that's what we want to do. So we want to go to Daniel the prophet. Daniel, now, what are we all, what's the main thing you know about Daniel? I'm sure all of you have heard of Daniel. If I say Daniel, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Lion's den. Lion's den. Is that right, kids? Daniel and the lion's den? True? Exactly. We all know Daniel as the man that was thrown into the lion's den. What a lot of people don't really probably know is he was about 90 years old when he got thrown in the lion's den. Everyone thinks he was a young boy, a young man. He was about 90. He was at the end of his life after 70 years of captivity. We reckon he was nearly around 20 years old when he was taken to captivity. This is towards the end of that captivity of 70 years. So he's nearly 90, around 90 years of age. He gets thrown into the lion's den. Well, let me tell you something. That's one small part of Daniel, the best part or the, the majority of, of Daniel's life was giving prophecy, God giving him prophecy. Now I'm going to very quickly summarise in the next 15 minutes as we bring this to a close, one of Daniel's prophecy. It's a very amazing ancient dream. It is fascinating. You're going to find this hopefully really um, interesting that you'll think, oh, I've got to find out what the next little bit is because all will be revealed in our following seminars. This is all about a king's dream. Now we don't have time to really read all of Daniel chapter 2, but I'm going to get you to open it up because I'm going to get you to colour another verse in in Daniel chapter 2. All right, who's the first one to find it and tell us the page number? Daniel chapter 2 and the page number when someone's got it. Oh, that's in your Bible, Joey. <laughs> I'm talking about one of these Bibles. The little Bible here. Well done though, Joey, but that's your Bible. The little Bible, who can tell me what page it's on? Seven, uh, well done. I never get you, I get you two mixed up. Johnny, Dave. Who said it, Dave or Johnny? They're twins, by the way, you can't half tell. But, uh, <laughs> one's got a beard. <laughs> um, exactly, 7.30 is the actual page we're looking at uh, for Daniel chapter 2. What I'm going to suggest to you, or not suggest, is put up on the screen as it is here, is that the prophecy we're going to be dealing with is 2,618 years old. That's how old this prophecy is. And yet, as we're going to see, as we go through a little bit of time, is that this prophecy starts back 2,618 years ago, traverses right through history, right up to today, and even beyond today, and tells us things that are going to happen. And everything that it says was going to happen right up today has happened with 100% accuracy, why would we doubt the next little bit? So, we're going to have an experiment again, and this is not going to take long at all, boys. This one's going to be very quick. I'm going to get you to put your names on these. Liam, Jackson, quick. How'd you come? Give one of these to each of them. If there's not enough, maybe share one between husband and wife if you're here together. I'm going to get you and you have to be fast, Jackson. I'm going to see how fast. There's going to be a race between you boys. Go. Come on. Lick your fingers. Make them work harder. That's it. Keep going. Jackson, you're falling behind time. <laughs> Liam's really going. This is the experiment. The paper that you've been given, I want you to get your pen out and I want you to circle around. Don't forget Graham down the back there. And, and is there some of that? Please don't exclude anyone there in the back. On the paper given to each table, I want you to circle around what you believe has been a world empire from 2,600 years ago. A world empire. And I want you to put a number alongside each of the circles you've indicated, indicating the order in which these empires took place. Now here's a little clue. What constitutes a world empire? Well, the clue is very simple. We're only looking for world empires within the last 2,600 years because that's when this prophecy was made. It starts 2,600 years ago. 
and the definition of a world empire, an empire where military power was used to overthrow all other then known military powers, and where taxes were exacted from these same nations as well as cultural and national influences being exerted on them. Liam, this is right up your alley. I can tell you want to probably phone a friend right now, don't you? Hey? <laughs> Can you understand that? Probably not, and probably I might have lost a few of the others as well. But have a think about it. Circle around what you think is a world empire in the last 2,600 years and the order in which they existed. Now, just put your name up the top. This is not going to be an examination, and I don't expect those of us that have been here perhaps for the first time or perhaps know very little about the Bible to know what the answer is. Uh, but nonetheless, it doesn't matter. It just gives you a little bit of an idea to play around and come up with what you think is right. So this is what your sheet would look like now. Just circle around the world empires you reckon there's been. No doubt Lionel's going to circle New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> which nearly they were a world empire once, New Zealand. That was the underarm bowling incident that we probably will remember many years ago. I'm sure those who are old enough here will remember that. New Zealand was going to overthrow Australia and probably anyone else that dared <laughs> ever bowl underarm again to the New Zealand batsman. Who was batting, Mark? Jeremy Coney. Yep, there you go. And Mark knows his history. <laughs> Who bowled? Trevor Chappell. Amazing. All right. Now, you don't have to hand them up now. I'll leave them there and I'll collect them off you afterwards. That's fine. So, your attention back here again. I'm going to teach you something very important about the Bible, and it's the importance of carefully reading what is said and then trying to understand what it means. So, I've got your colour in pencils because I'm going to get you to colour in Daniel 2, verse 44. It's actually on page 731 of your Bibles, those that have got the ones that you were given, and you'll see that quotation there, coloured in with a colouring pencil. This is another very important verse in the Bible, a very important prophetical verse in the Bible. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, when I read that just as a verse, to me that is totally a meaningless statement. I have no idea what it's talking about. I have no idea what it means. I have absolutely no idea who Daniel is, what the context is, why that verse is there, and what's it all about. And the reason is because... Unless you read the entire chapter, then you really can't get a handle on that verse. So it's always very important that you can't just pick up the Bible and pick one verse out and read and expect to understand it. Context, as we've said on the screen, context equals understanding. So your homework this week is to read Daniel chapter 2. That's not bad, is it? Some of the homework these kids get is a lot more than what I used to get at their age. Read Daniel chapter 2 before next week. I'd love you to do it. You're going to find it most interesting if you do because next week we're going to show you what it's all about. So I want you to read that. All right, let's just have a very quick look at this dream. What did... Who's, who knows the king, by the way, his name? Well done, who said that? Oh, you did. It sounded like one of the kids. <laughs> Jackson? Nebuchadnezzar. Anyone ever heard Nebuchadnezzar? Those that perhaps haven't been to our seminars before? You ever heard of Nebuchadnezzar, Sandy? Probably not. Have you ever heard of one of the ancient wonders of the world called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon? That is one of the most well listed ancient wonders of the world. Nebuchadnezzar built that, and he built that because he married a Phoenician wife who came from a very fertile area and had beautiful gardens. And when he got her back into Babylon, which is in a pretty arid area, Babylon, by the way, is in, is, uh, in Iraq today. And uh, it's just a bunch of ruins, as we're going to see next week. But the point I want to make is that he gets his wife back there 
and she is homesick for the beauty of where she came from and she's sullen and she's sad and you know wives get homesick and he thought well what do I do and he's the most powerful uh, king on the planet Babylon being a huge monolithic wealthy uh, kingdom he decides that he's going to pour a few hundred million dollars into building a garden and he builds the most wonderful garden on the rooftop palace of, of Babylon called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. They hung down the walls of his palace and it was absolutely magnificent. It was like the best botanical garden you could ever find in Australia, maybe even our own, and imagine it being plonked on top of his palace. It became known as the, the, the hanging, amazing Hanging Gardens of Babylon and it was uh, set up by King Nebuchadnezzar to, to keep his wife happy and not be so homesick. I don't know if it worked or not, but anyway, it was obviously magnificent. So that's the king we're talking about. He's the king that has this dream, and he did exist. You can go in history books, you'll see that the man did exist. So he was there and he did create these wonderful gardens. This dream greatly concerned the king. Don't forget this is 2,618 years ago we're talking about this dream. Um, it was a dream that was certainly going to uh, disturb him because it was so real and so powerful. And now we're going to have a little look at this dream very quickly and then next week we're going to discuss it. But you're going to read a little bit about this in your uh, reading for the week of Daniel chapter 2. So what did the uh, king dream and what was the outcome? Well, in essence, this is what he dreamt. He laid on his bed asleep and he was fast asleep and all of a sudden this most vivid vision of this massive tall giant huge I don't know if it was a scary looking man or whoever it was but was standing there with huge authority perhaps his arms were crossed and he was looking straight down with his eyes beating in on King Nebuchadnezzar is on his bed so by this stage he's looking at this massive massive uh, a, a statue but he looks at it all the more and he sees something quite amazing you know read all this in Daniel chapter 2 as he looks at it he says to himself, well, hang on a second, this is an amazing looking statue. What is it? And all of a sudden he sees the head was made of gold. And he sees the chest and the arms are made of silver. And he's thinking to himself, What's, what is with this statue? It's different metals. And the belly and thighs are made of brass. And as he's looking, he's saying, well, now the legs are made of iron. And then all of a sudden he's looking down at the feet and they're made part of iron and part of clay. And he's looking and saying, wow, this is an odd looking, uh, odd looking image. I, I've never seen anything like it. And as he's watching it and it's scaring him because he, he obviously wakes up in an in absolute sweat and the beads are perspiring against, on his forehead as he's, he's, he's looking at this vision, which by the way we know from the chapter God gave him this dream, he gave him this vision, it was just so real, his heart was pounding, it was just amazing. And as he's watching, all of a sudden he turns to one side and he sees this great mountain. And as he's looking, he sees this rock being carved out of the mountain, but no one's carving it out, there's no one there, there's no workers carving it out, it's just happening on its own. No human hands are carving this rock out of the mountain. And all of a sudden, as he looks at that rock, he looks back at that image, he looks at the rock, and the rock comes hurtling away from this mountain at absolute massive speed. It's a huge rock, and it comes heading towards this image, and it smashes the image on the feet, deliberately at a certain area, and the whole image comes crashing down. The rock grinds the whole image, the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, the clay, grinds the whole lot, lot up into dust the wind blows it away and then that rock just grows and grows and fills the whole earth now by this stage the king wakes up <gasps> he's out of breath his heart is pounding what is this all about what is it all about i have absolutely no idea this has got me worried and of course in those days anything of this nature was seen as some sort of divine um, uh, intervention by God to give you something that you need to know what the answer is about. So what does he do? He's a smart king. He's a real clever king. The next morning he gets up. I don't even know if he waited till the morning. I'd suggest to you that what he did 
was he got up straight away and he summoned his soothsayers, you know, the crystal ball gazers, the charlatans of this world, the, the Nostradamuses and all of these people that think they can predict the future. And he gathers them all into him and he says, guys, I've just had this most awesome dream. It's absolutely riveted me. I don't know what it's about. My heart is pounding. I've got sweat just pouring off my face. I've got to know what the meaning of it is. And they go, sure, King, that's no problem. Just tell us what the dream is and we'll nudge, nudge, wink, wink. We'll tell you what, what it's all about you know we'll, we'll make it up that's how they thought the king he's not stupid he says no nah. now if you're so good you guys you tell me what the dream is and you tell me the the, uh, the interpretation as well because then I'll know that your interpretation is right but you've got to tell me what the dream is of course that was an impossibility these are mere men there's no way they're going to know what the dream is absolutely not and he, he gives them a little incentive to try harder by saying to them, if you don't tell me what the dream is and the interpretation, you're all going to be put to death. So now their hearts are pounding. <laughs> They're broken out into a sweat and they've got to do something quick smart. So you know what they do? Daniel 2 will tell you what they do. They know that there's a Jewish captive that has led an exemplary life so far in their midst in Babylon. His name is Daniel. And they know that that man, Daniel, speaks to the God of Israel regularly through prayer. And they know that he is the standout man as far as uh, anything to do with a God that is alive and well. And they're on their last legs. They don't know what to do. So they come to Daniel and say, Daniel, we don't know if you can help us or not, but you've got to please save us because we're going to be put to death unless somebody can tell the king what the dream is and what the interpretation of the dream is. And Daniel doesn't take the credit for himself. He says, well, if God will tell me what that dream is and what the interpretation is, then it's meant to be. And he goes to the king and he says this to the king. There is a God in heaven, he says to the king. He doesn't say this is going to be me. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and maketh known to the king what shall be. Now there's that term again. Remember I told you to lock it up here? In the latter days, thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And it goes on to list what the dream is, and we won't get to that tonight. As for thee, O king, my thoughts came, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets makes known to thee what shall come to pass. In other words, King, I'm going to tell you the dream, but it's not coming from me. God's going to tell me what it is because I've got no way of knowing. I'm only a mere mortal man. I'm no self-proclaimed prophet. I only get told what God tells me. But I will tell you the dream because God's going to tell me what the dream is. And then I'm going to tell you the interpretation. And it's all got to do with what's about to come to pass. So here's what the King dreamt. He saw this massive image. It frightened the daylights out of him. He woke up in the middle of the night in a great sweat. This great image was there before him and it had a head of glittering gold. Uh, we know that it also had chest and arms of shimmering silver. The belly and thighs were of brass, all distinctly different metals. The uh, legs, two of them, legs of inflexible iron, and finally, the feet were part iron and part clay. They didn't really mix too well together. And the whole image is on that very unstable uh, uh, foundation. And then, what did, the, what did the, uh, the king see next? Can you remember what he saw next? You, any of you two little ones listening? What did he see next? What happened next to the image? Liam. A rock. What happened? What did the rock do? Absolutely. He saw this rock come screaming and hurtling out of the mountain, smash the image on the feet. The whole image was just totally wiped out, ground down to powder. The powder was blown off into the wind and that rock began to fill the whole earth. And the king is wondering, what on earth is all that about? What is that all about? What does it mean? I tell you what, if I had a dream like that, and it was so powerful and so vivid, because I don't know about you, but I, I tend to get up in the morning, I know I've dreamt, but I really can't remember what the dreams are. I can remember little snippets. 
The king remembered every final small detail of this dream because God burnt it into his mind so that when Daniel recalled the dream back to him, he would know that, boy, this, this lad here, this, this, this Jewish slave, he's got something very special. He is something very, very special because there's no way in the world he could tell me that exact dream and it's burnt up here and he just told it to me, so it's very special. What does it all mean? What is it all about? You're going to be fascinated with this. I can tell you next week you will be fascinated with the outcome of this dream because it talks about up to today and beyond. So next week, God willing, this amazing prophecy is going to be unlocked. It's going to leave you totally amazed and we hope to see you all being well next week. We did go for about an hour but we did get a 10 minute late start so if you can please be here by 7.30 next week that would be absolutely fascinating. Now also next week uh, we're going to have on display and Liam you would love this. We're going to have on display the world's smallest Bible, one of the world's smallest Bibles that was printed in the 1800s. You, you've got no idea how they did this. It's worth quite a bit of money but I've got the person who owns it is willing to let us have a look at it and bring it along uh, and it is amazing in the 1800s and when you see it you will be absolutely mesmerized as uh, as indeed i was when i first saw it so same time same place next week please come please bring your bibles please bring your notes um, one thing i didn't say about the notes is we're not necessarily following the notes in order much of the stuff i'm telling you is in your notes and some more but we're doing it in our own good, good fashion and our own good way that we hope you'll all find it interesting. So what I'm going to ask now is you just remain...